Good morning, good morning, good morning. Well, first of all, I want to thank the Creator for another beautiful day. Um, today's topic we're going to be talking about is uh, forgiveness and being gentle to ourselves. I think, uh, especially now in this time of uh, <clears throat> what's going on, we need to really take a look at uh, forgiveness and how we can really embrace that more. For myself, I can only talk about what I've been through in my life, my experiences, and how forgiveness is like uh, almost like setting yourself free from carrying shame, guilt, uh, fear, anger, whatever um, you've been carrying. But for me, anyway, I can only talk about myself and uh, share my journey on how important uh, forgiveness is. I remember reading a bunch of quotes about forgiveness, and the one that really stuck out in my mind was about, um, you know, forgiveness doesn't, you know, correct that behavior that someone is doing to you. It frees your heart from dying. And it's so, for me, it, it resonated like um, how powerful that tool is when you can forgive yourself for all the choices you made in your life. So yeah, I'll uh, I'll give you as an example of uh, forgiveness. So um, I think this happened about ten years ago. So me and a, a colleague, we uh, used to do everything together: dance, travel, presentations, and all of a sudden the the relationship didn't work out. So we kind of went our separate ways. And uh, yeah, I was feeling guilty about what could I have done better, should have, could have, would have, that mentality we sometimes get into. And I prayed about it for a long time. I says, you know, I got to be, I got to be the strong one. You know, I got to be the humble one. I got to be the gentle one. Because, uh, you know, we keep on feeding this negativity, you know, it's going to grow bigger and it's going to eventually explode. So I went to an elder and talked about it, what happened. And he says, uh, you need to forgive yourself. And I thought, well, I wasn't in the wrong. Why should I forgive myself? He said, well, you need to forgive yourself for the part you played in that situation, that in that experience. And I struggled with that for a long time. How the heck do I forgive myself? for something I didn't do, you know, but I did say some things. So that's one of the things that I had to do is, you know, get honest with myself and say, okay, well, yeah, I did have a part to play in that experience. I did. I could have not said some, some of those things. I could have, you know, just continued on and been a, a pillar of that relationship. So it took me a long time to really say, okay, well, I forgive myself for what uh, what I did in that experience. I can't change it. I can only say, okay, I'm going to forgive myself. You know, because for so many times, for so many years, I was hard on myself because of that experience. And just that day, I made that conscious decision to say, okay, forgive. You know, it's going to be okay. You know, it's going to be okay. Boy, just like a, a whole my life kind of like um, got lighter, you know, because when I used to see him around, I, I, that feeling, that feeling of, you know, would uh, come about that uncomfortable feeling. So I would just, I would just to say, you know what, I'm just going to pray for them, pray that they could have a long, healthy life, you know, instead of getting angry or, or whatever. And for me, that's what has helped me immensely is like, forgiving myself from all those things that uh, definitely um, impact you, friendships, relationships. And you just have to say, you know, it's not, you know, it's not that bad. Everything that we go through in life, we can learn something very valuable. And what I learned was that, you know, um, forgiveness, forgive yourself, forgive that experience, forgive that individual. 
It's like setting yourself free, you know, and then you begin to learn to be gentle with yourself instead of being so hard on yourself. So today, when I see that individual in the community, I just say a prayer, you know, no longer does it impact my emotional state. No longer does it impact my mental state, my spiritual state, or my physical state like it once did. And that's how I know forgiveness is such an important tool in our life. You know, as, a, as we get older as well, you, uh, you find ways to forgive quicker. Is because you don't want to carry that. You don't want to carry that into tomorrow. Because tomorrow is never guaranteed for anybody. So that's why we say, you know, do your work today. Do your self-work today. Do your self-awareness work today. Because, you know, no one's guaranteed tomorrow. So these are things that have helped me immensely on my journey as a helper. And I think, uh, you know, we all, we all need a starting point. And I think hopefully having this dialogue will give you your starting point to uh, just to begin to think how important um, you you are to yourself. Because that's another thing I've heard. You don't owe anyone in this world anything. You owe you. So if you want to be a good helper, if you want to be a good provider, you owe it to yourself to begin to do that work in order to become you know, that, that good worker for the community. Um, forgiveness. Um, so for me, uh, forgiveness is what gave me the ability to live my life in peace. Um, I'm sorry, my name is Angie. Hi, good morning. morning. Uh, so what I found was that I, I, I lived my life in anger for so many years and I projected my anger upon other people and I projected it towards myself, of course, because I, I had to live with it as well. And um, I found that I didn't even really know what I was angry about. So when I started doing some healing and that I, I started to um, learn about my past and our past as Indigenous people and that's what gave me the ability to understand that hurt people hurt people and i was eventually able to let go of that anger and to find understanding and compassion towards the people who actually hurt me so forgiveness was huge so being able to forgive others gave me the ability to move forward in my life with more peace and joy and contentment being an addict in recovery it's uh forgiveness for me was um again it was solely based on you know forgiving others but ultimately forgiving myself for you know my shortcomings or, or my the, the ones i thought were shortcomings excuse me i'm just gonna let these people in here sorry um and for all the stuff i i, I put you know, let's say my, my son's mom through, or my son for that matter. Um, it wasn't until, you know, I realized that by forgiving myself, I, I, I freed myself and I'm able to, to move on in life and, and, and make better decisions and, and fix everything I, I quote unquote messed up, you know, while, while I was an addict or living in my addiction at that point. That's forgiveness for me. When we think about how we can improve our life in regards to forgiveness and uh, this other um, part of being gentle with ourselves. Um, when I think about being gentle with myself, I don't know if you guys ever heard that self-love. Um, but for me, when I first heard that, I thought it was, you know, like uh, touching yourself or something like that. I didn't really understand that concept of because that word was never really shared with me growing up in my home. Eh? Love yourself first, you know, be kind to yourself, be gentle with yourself. I never heard that, though, that, that language until like maybe the past 20 years uh, before that, that those things were, weren't really shared with me or discussed with me. So it was, it was a foreign 
um, language to me to love myself. Because like I said, that word love was never shared in my home growing up. And uh, so for me, I had to go on this journey. Okay, what is, what is self-love? What is, you know, self-acceptance? What is self-esteem? You know, so I had to go through all this um, researching of finding out what those things were. And for me, I think the, the the greatest gift you can give to yourself is to love yourself unconditionally. Whereas some people tend to have conditions on themselves. And, um, but for me, it's like, how do I love myself unconditionally? So I took in many therapy, uh, been in many therapy group sessions. I talked to psychologists. I talked to professionals in the field of uh you know, wellness and well-being. And they said, it begins with a thought. When you begin to think and change your, your behavioral patterns, that's when you can begin to really, truly um, embrace yourself for what you are. You are love. You know, you do matter. Um, people do care about you. People do love you. Um, so for me, I had to go on this long journey of 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 self-acceptance you know because i got many scars i have many you know experiences that would leave any other human being uh feeling unlovable unwantable undesirable so for me i had to fight through all those you know experiences and say it happened to me because i'm a strong individual i'm not stronger than anyone else but i'm, I'm stronger than I, I once was when i was six years old when I was seven years old, when I was eight years old, those times that those experiences happened for me, you know, left me vulnerable, left me, you know, feeling anger, rage, hatred. So I had to fight through all those experiences and say, you know, I'm, I'm okay today. You know, no longer am I living in memory, but I'm living in the moment. And I think that's the the greatest gift you can give yourself is to say everything that happened in my past, you know, are, are tools for me today, tools for me to help other people. You know, they're not meant to hurt people, but just to make them more aware of that do people do care. So when you say you, you love yourself and you can look in the mirror, you look in the mirror and say, Oh my God, I love you. I love everything about you. I appreciate you. You know, at first, it might sound, seem silly, and I, this is what I had to do in order to get to a place of love, get to a place of, you know, betterment. And so the first little while, it was just like shy, silly, you know, but once you your thought, you know, buys into that idea, eventually your life will begin to improve because no one can love you more in this world than the way you can love yourself. I'll say that again. No one in this world can love you more than you can love yourself. And they used to think, man, that's such a profound statement. That's such a profound statement. Nobody in this world can love me more than I can love myself. And telling myself that over and over and over. Because that's what insanity is, you know, thinking something's going to change, right? Because you keep on doing it over and over and over like relapsing, for for instance, I was the best relapser. I'd have, you know, 10 days of sobriety, boom, you know, something would trigger me. Okay, I made it 10 days, I'm going to celebrate. Or, uh, you know, I made it one month, 30 days, one time. Yeah, 30 days, you know, drug and alcohol free. And I have to celebrate, you know, so these are insanity. Keep on doing something over and over and expecting different results. So the more time you, you spend on the thought process of telling yourself, I love myself, I'm going to be gentle to myself, I'm going to be kind to myself, you know, because we're, we're, we can be the, our worst critics at times, especially in our healing journey, you know, we're not doing it fast enough, look at them over there, you know, so we begin, we, we begin to compare ourselves with our environment when that's, you know, the wrong path to go down. We need to focus on our own, our own journey and what we're going through, what we're experiencing, what we're feeling. Sometimes we need to journal that. Sometimes we need to sit and take a look at that 
you know, where's these feelings coming from? Why am I being triggered? You know, and maybe reaching out and talking to someone, hey, I'm triggered, I need to, you know, to talk and, you know, to share my experience. So that's the beginning point is just the thought, you know, everything begins with a thought. Now we have to put that thought into action with words, with, um, you know, writing, with sharing, um, with connecting with others that are on the same journey as us and allowing them to be a support pillar in our journey as well. So, yeah, for me, that's where, uh, where it all begins with a thought and then putting that thought into action making it reality. So how do you um, improve on yourself on a daily basis? That's the question I want to ask each and every one of you. How do you improve on yourself every day? Uh, for myself, I, I just try to learn, right? Learn something new every day. Because if I'm learning, I'm growing, right? And, and uh, if I'm growing, I'm changing old behaviors. You know, and, and I want to say I get that instant gratification when I, when I, you know, when I stop myself from saying something I probably would have said yesterday, right? It's, it's, for me, it's just about growth and learning. For myself, with my recovery lately, I've been just really, um, work in my program first and foremost by reading the literature of the 12 step program that I attend. Um, you know, going to meetings, being a service there. Um, it's weird because sometimes you, you know, you can get caught in like codependency, but being a service in a good way of not wanting anything back the the gifts that that has brought is just unreal like phenomenal um you know thinking of myself but yet still thinking of others but not in a bad way like how can i say that not in a unhealthy way you know making sure that I'm taking care of me. So like you said, I can only love myself before I can love others. So when I'm truly taking care of myself and loving me, um, it's so, so much easier to be able to give back to others without wanting something in return. And showing that love and compassion to myself helps me be able to do it to others and just um, support group too, like reaching out to friends and, and speaking my truth and being open to suggestions of applying that, those things in my life. Um, having my relationship with the creator, like getting up in the morning and and smudging and saying my prayers and doing my readings. Like it's all things that I have put into action on a daily basis for myself. And I find by doing so, you know, my day is so much more at ease. Like I don't feel like I'm letting my day run me if that makes sense. Um, yeah. You know, like, cause before it was like, just get up and go. And, and now that I'm taking the time to get connected with the creator and getting connected with my positive readings and stuff, it just sets the mood for the day. Um, talking to my friends in, in recovery, um, yeah, it's just, it's beautiful. Like I, I am truly grateful to have found recovery in my life because I was completely lost and broken. And today I feel I am growing. I'm learning to accept where I am and 
that's been a big one. Um, that acceptance piece, you know, was a hard one for a long time, but like I know you were talking about forgiveness earlier too, and you know, doing doing my step work and working through that stuff and even learning to see my side of the street has been a big eye opener to not let people's actions detect my reaction. But you know, that's, that's a daily work. Like as much as <laughs> I'm working it, some days I can, can let someone get to me. And usually when that happens, it's usually cause I haven't been connecting with people in recovery or not doing my daily smudging or those kind of things. So yeah, just, just cha changing that negative um, way of getting up for me is, has been a big change to my life. So yeah, I'll stop talking. <laughs> I'll chime in. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, it's work. It's, it's always, it's, it's daily work because sometimes we, we sit in our bliss and our joy and we're thankful for all the things that we have, but then sometimes we get complacent and we have certain things that happen in our life and struggles and somehow I have a hard time holding on to all of the, the bliss and the joy that I felt just a day or two before. So it's constant work. I, I consistently work, listen to positive motivation videos and and of course prayer and uh, just trying to you know help others and to be kind to others and to do all those things that feed our soul and um, I think that's an important part of a uh, healing is is not to become complacent and to continually work towards you know becoming a better version of yourself so when we learn to experience guilty feelings as a way of receiving information we re we uh, already are healing from our mistakes. The emotional, the emotion of guilt lets us know that our actions and behaviors conflict with our values and beliefs. You know, for me, I'm, I'm always aware of that today. I'm always, you know, trying to evolve my thought process and, 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 and making sure that, you know, am I, am I on the right path? Am I on the right track? journey in life that I'm supposed to be on in regards does it correlate does it align with you know my goals my values that who I am today as an individual as a helper so it's just constantly reminding yourself I think each and every day that yeah we go through you know these experience of guilt shame sometimes we carry them uh, longer than they need to be carried but some of us, you know, have a good way of uh, keeping it in the back, back of our pocket, you know, just in case uh, we might need it one day. And that's what an older one's told me. He says, uh, why, why are you carrying that? How, how, what, what purpose does it serve you? And for me, I said, well, because I'm a survivor. You know, I've been through this trauma. You know, when I was in jail, it, it served its purpose. And he says, well, you're not living there no more. He says, you have to live in the moment, be in the moment. Because when you're living in the past, when you're living in the memory, it's hard for you to experience something beautiful in the moment. Because you're always thinking about, oh, someone's going to hurt me. Someone's going to stab me. Someone's going to shank me. And that mentality. So you have to change that mentality. Like I said on, on Friday, when, uh, you know, when you change your thoughts and you change out your behavior and you begin to let go of all that stuff that kept you down, that kept you from being your authentic self, um, you, you miss so many of the blissful moments that are right in front of you. Relationships, um, experiences, because it's hard for you to get out of that, that, uh, that past, you know, you're not there no more. And that's, that's some of the things that you have to remind yourself of every day is that I'm not living in that memory, you know, because sometimes that memory is so traumatic that it, it, it just drives you crazy. And I can only speak for myself because that's where I was for, for quite a few years, you know, early in my recovery. I wanted to, you know, um, 
in the last shot, I wanted to relapse. And it was just going through those emotions of, you know, carrying that shame and guilt and that what that elder said was so true. What purpose does it serve you today on the outside world? And I had to think, well, well it doesn't serve me anything. And what am I surviving for? You know, what are you, what are you really surviving for? So you can either be a survivor or a thriver. And today I try, I choose to be a thriver and learn from all my experiences, not to say that I'm better than anyone, but just to say I'm a little bit better than I, how I used to be, how I used to behave in certain situations. That used to baffle me, that used to, you know, enrage me, you know. So these are the things that have definitely helped me today, you know, be the best example of myself. So, yeah, these are some of the things that take practice. Uh, as you know, practice makes improvement. There's nothing perfect in this world. There's no one perfect. Um, so yeah, you just have to keep on being uh, open, I guess, to experiencing something beautiful instead of living in your memories, your hurt, your pain, your shame and guilt. Um, because it doesn't serve you any uh, type of purpose today. So another thing I, I've uh, been reading is that um, guilt, serves a purpose right shame does not um guilt you tend to understand exactly what you did wrong why you made the mistake or the you know the choice um and you can begin to repair that situation there's nothing uh left to do shame is a bit trickier with shame you feel like you're underneath a pile with no way to climb up which is not a helpful way to heal. So you have to think about, you know, guilt serves a purpose and shame. Like, I don't know how many have ever felt shame before, but it doesn't feel good. Right? I remember early on in, in, as a child in these foster homes, you know, shame on you for being Indian. And I never understood that. Like, why, why, why should I shame on me for being an Indian? I never understood that word, Indian. You know, I never understood um, savage, all those things that I was taught, you know, when I was in those. So for me, I began to learn shame at a very young age in my life. And I carried that into my adult life. You know, I'm, I should be shameful because I'm Indian. And I think a lot of like from what I experienced, there's, there was a lot of indigenous people that were shameful. Because this is where my shame took me. I think I was about... 13 years old when I went to Winnipeg, Manitoba and uh, I was going to school there and the reason why I, I got taken out of Edmonton is because I was you know going down the wrong path I joined a gang and my mom said nope sending you to Manitoba go live with your auntie and we're gonna uh, straighten you out and then my auntie was very disciplined she had 12 children she was the matriarch of the of the family and so when I went there, uh, I got into school and right away I seen that, you know, Winnipeg was a pretty racist place. And so I just kind of, you know, I was gravit toward, gravitated towards these Mexicans. And the reason why is because they had the best smoke. I'm just kidding. But because of the fact that that shame, that's where that shame uh, led me to. People, are you, are, you, are you Indian or what? I said, no, man, I'm Mexicano, you know. So that's where my shame took me, you know, and shame will take you to places that, um, you know, you never thought you'd ever go. So I'll just leave it at that. But shame, that's where my shame took me. It took me to take on a new identity, you know. So for me, I had to deal with that shame and say, you know, I'm Indigenous, you know, I'm First Nations. So I had to, you know, embrace all these labels that we now have today. Uh, which is kind of um, unfortunate that we have more labels than any other um, group of people in Canada, Indigenous, First Nations, Native, uh, Indian, um, whatever, whatever label you want to. So you have to come up with an identity that makes sense to you. So for me, I had to talk to this uh, elder and I listened to John Trudell and he told the people that, we're older than that concept, Indian. You know, we never used to say, hey, how's it going, my Indian? You know, thousands of years ago, we were human beings. 
you know, today the language that my people speak is Nehiawak. And Nehiawak doesn't mean Cree. Nehiawak doesn't mean Indian. Nehiawak doesn't mean indigenous. It means the four parts people. So we the reason we're the four parts people because our that's the you know the belief that we've always had, you know, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical. And to keep those four parts strong and healthy every day. And so for me, when I think about Nehiawak, the, the language and how important it is to, to share that is it, so important on um, embracing your authentic identity, which whatever that is, it, it could be your, your tribe. It could be, you know, maybe got adopted into a tribe. Maybe, you know, um, you've been named. Maybe you've been uh, welcomed, you know. So it's up to you as an individual to really embrace your identity for who you are. You know, I believe we're all human beings and um, being okay, being comfortable with that, like really, truly being comfortable with that is a good place to really accepting yourself, loving yourself, forgiving yourself um, and being okay you know, with life, I think uh, that's where we all, we eventually, we all have this desire, I think, to, to have peace, to have balance, and to be in, in, in unison with, um, with our environment. You know, I, I think no one wakes up saying, oh, I'm going to get into conflict with that group of people today, just because, you know, maybe some do, but I don't, I don't have that thought of, you know, conflict 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 anymore is because when you think about peace tranquility self-love forgiveness uh, honor respect dignity and you you know you have values all those other things uh, become uh, not as important as the bliss that you're feeling in that moment you know so i think the message today is you know don't don't be afraid to find your bliss don't be afraid to you know find what works for you just for today like i said no one is guaranteed tomorrow next week next month next year so all we have is this moment so uh what are you going to do about it you know so for me i'm always in that that thought process what can i do in this moment to be the best example of me hi sorry i came late i was on a work call um but I, I kind of tuned in when you were sharing about that shame and the labels. And I know for myself, um, I too carried a lot of that shame. And I hung out as well with a lot of the Latino community where I grew up. Um, and I too heard those terms. And it was my first time hearing those terms, savage and, and wagon burner were the ones that I heard growing up in Abbotsford. And um, I, I carried a lot of shame about being Indigenous, uh, back then First Nations. Um, and I had really long hair and lots of people thought I looked like Winnie from uh, Wonder Years. And so I would tell people I was Hawaiian. And uh, a lot of the people that I hung out with were Latino. A lot of them were actually from El Salvador, or Mexico City. And so that's kind of who I would hang out with. And, and it was so interesting how there was still um, racism and prejudicism, but it was more accepted to, I was more accepted to say that I was Spanish or Hawaiian than to say I was indigenous. And so a good portion of my younger years, you know, um, my identity, I just wouldn't acknowledge it. And I carried so much shame over that for many, many years. And I think it was in grade 10 when I had a teacher approach me, Mr. Bourne was his name. He was a social studies teacher. And um, I guess on the school forms, my mom had identified me as First Nations. And so they were having a program where all the First Nations kids uh, would get this opportunity to do an exchange program to Old Crow Yukon. And uh, so he approached me and he said, are you indigenous? Are you First Nations? And uh, I was really hesitant to answer, uh, but I was afraid of lying. I didn't want to lie and then get caught and then get in trouble. So I said yes. And 
anyways, I got to be a part of this exchange program and I went to this little community, Old Crow, and uh, it was the best experience I ever had. And I got to witness kids my age who were um, singing their traditional songs, speaking their traditional language, living off the land. They were teaching us kids, us urban kids, um, about those things. And there was so much, um, when they put on their traditional regalias, I guess, um, they, they were different. It was like they walked different, they spoke different, um, they acted different. And, you know, myself and my, my other classmates got to witness, witness that. And I came back um, more curious about my roots and I didn't start to come into it fully until my 20s when I was introduced to an elder and you know he he's in spirit now but he really um, helped me work through some of that shame that I carried about being an Indigenous girl at that time and or a young woman and um, but then what I noticed as I started to, I grew up in Nostalo territory out here in BC, and um, uh, that's kind of what my whole life was exposed to until I met my spiritual father, um, who introduced me to more of like my prairie teachings. Um, but, you know, I, that was all I knew was the Stalo, the Stalo way, the Stalo practices, the Stalo songs, um, ceremonies, etc but I never really actually had a sense of belonging there. Um, and I, I really struggled uh, with finding a sense of belonging because I knew I wasn't from this territory out here. And some of those ceremonies, my spirit wasn't speaking to it, I guess. I don't know if that makes sense to you. But um, anyways, he taught me a lot about my Indigenous roots, but then my, my, my career ended up my career ended up developing at a young age. So it's been about 17 or 18 years now of working and supporting indigenous community in different capacities. And I became so entrenched in it that I forgot about the other part of me. And for many years, I carried shame about being, um, you know, what a lot of people call a half breed, you know, um, that I have a lot of European in, in me as well on my mother's side. And I became ashamed of that. And I didn't want to acknowledge that side of me. And it would be embarrassing sometimes for me if I had to acknowledge or if someone acknowledged that, you know, oh, you know, um, what are you? I can't quite figure out what you are. And then to say that I am Indigenous and a list of all these other things from my mom's side. And it's only in the last couple, you know, probably four years where I have been working at acknowledging and being proud of both sides of my family, of my genetic makeup. And um, I think even my work, I was entrenched in the work of truth and reconciliation for about three years. And that really helped me as well. And my spiritual father, because he really did acknowledge those four directions and that we are all related, we are all one, and we all energetically need each other, you know, in order for Mother Earth and for a brighter future, really. Um, but that shame just runs so, so deep in regards to my identity anyways. I mean, there's all different capacities of shame. But um, when I was listening to you speak, I was like, man, I can relate to that. I can relate to that shame of being Indigenous and then being like when I would go back to Siksika, I'm from Siksika Nation on my dad's side outside of Calgary, they would call me Apple, um, they'd call me a city Indian, they'd make fun of me because I didn't have an accent. I had a really hard time of finding a sense of belonging in Siksika and with family. I was always like a joke all the time and I would always just laugh it off, laugh it off, laugh it off, but it actually really hurt me. It really hurt me and so I, I didn't have a sense of belonging in Siksika and I didn't have a sense of belonging in, in urban community. And it was really hard. It's like you're too white to be Indian, too Indian to be white. And, I, and uh, just that journey that I've been walking to find balance and shame is definitely, you know, come up in lots of different ways. But I am so grateful for the elders that have come into my life. And I'm so grateful for just panels like this even to have these kinds of conversations to talk about that 
um, because I find even our younger generation, uh, in the last several years, I've been working a lot with youth, um, they really struggle with their identities, including my own children. Like their father is, um, they say full blood indigenous, but I know somewhere in that line, there's some European contact. Um, and then my side as well. And my boys actually on their dad's side have kind of been raised because he's a residential school survivor of 10 years, um, raised to kind of uh, like shame non-Indigenous people. And so my boys, you know, they would say things like, oh, those Shamat people, Shamat being white people or dirty people. Um, oh, those Shamat people, you know, and they were talking like that. And literally just like this year, I think it was, um, it was around the time when I got my ancestry DNA back. Uh, I said to my son, I said, you know what, son, did you know that you are half white or well, not half, he's, um, uh, but that you have white in you? And he was so shocked. He was like almost devastated. He, he, he couldn't believe that. And I was like, well, yeah, mommy's mom is white. And they just looked at each other and it was almost like they were upset you know, uh, because on their dad's side, they've been learning this certain way of thinking. And so then we kind of had a conversation about like who my parents are and who their dad's parents are and what their genetics are made up of and um, tried to change that dialogue to be more proactive. But I tell you, our young kids, our young ones, our youth, they are really struggling and they live so much in that shame. Um, but anyways, I talked a lot. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, that's a little bit of how you touched my spirit in that moment. Thanks. So yeah, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for uh, for tuning in. Um, yeah, these these topics I think are, are geared towards uh, engaging in the community, uh, having a safe place where people can uh, share their experience as well. Um, like I said, I'm not uh, I'm not someone that you know, self-proclaims anything. I try to stay humble in my craft on my, on my earth walk here. Uh, I too can learn. I too can learn. And I really appreciate some of the, the words each and every one of you shared today in regards to uh, these topics. Forgiveness is, uh, like I said, for me was, was a really tough one. Um, you know, self, uh, self-love and uh, being kind to myself, being gentle to myself or, uh, another difficult thing that I had to uh, go through and embrace in my journey of uh, healing and recovery. Um, so yeah, it's just a, it's, it's a continuum. This healing journey will never end. It, it'll always, uh, uh, some days we'll have good days, some days we'll have great days, some days we'll even have fantastic days. Um, it's just being, you know, grateful in that moment of, uh, of learning and um I guess, accepting who we are as, as human beings, I think is such an, uh, an important factor in, uh, in this journey we call life. <laughs>